Greetings. Good day, sir. Can you hear me, Professor Langmuir? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good evening. Can you hear me too? Is it loud yes. enough? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Yes, welcome. Good to see you. So, how is uh, DC treating you? Oh, we are fine. At least the weather is friendly today and yesterday. So, no complaint for now. For now. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want us to uh, get started? You want to wait? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's start. No, I have no problem. I have no awesome. Problem. Okay, let's let's go ahead and get started. People are still uh, joining, but let's go ahead and get started. Sorry, thank you so much. All right, uh, I don't know how many people are on already, <clears throat> but I would like to start by saying that uh, you know Africa woke up from the wrong side of the bed, <laughs> and as Africa woke up from the wrong side of the bed. She hit her toe on the threshold while in searching for a way out to use the bathroom. And that pain, the pain from that toe still haunts Africa till today. I would like to go back to the Punic Wars of 146 BC before Christ. When the Romans invaded the babies of North Africa. And of course, we are all familiar with the destruction of Carthage. And they named that continent Africa. Africa in Roman language means sunshine. They did not even bother to find out how we were even calling ourselves on that continent. The name that Africa was calling itself at that time was Akel Bulan. And that name is still being used today by the Nubians and some people in Ethiopia. Then followed in the seventh century by Arab invasion of Africa. When Arabs came, they imposed Arabic language did not bother to find out what were the languages that Africans were speaking. So they imposed their language. So first was the name of the continent, then the language and religion. Then in the 15th century, the Europeans came starting with um, the Portuguese. In fact, as they were exploring the continent of Africa, they actually came to my own country and named my country Cameroon, Rio dos Camaros, because they saw rivers of prawns in Wuri. And they said Rio dos Camaros, which means in Portuguese, shrimps. So we still bear that name to today, Cameroon. So I am a shrimp because I've not bothered to change that name. And this happened in the entire African countries. They imposed names on us, and we accepted it to today. A few African countries have changed their name. Don't get me wrong. Then, of course, you know the massacre of King Leopold in Congo. And as the massacre was taken on, there was a the transatlantic slavery. This is still the mother Africa whose name was given. The Arabs came, now the Europeans have came, and they still continue to massacre a peaceful people. Now, 1884-1885 Berlin Conference, white people sat them in Berlin and divided the continent for themselves. They did not invite a single African to that conference. And that is why we have the artificial boundaries to today. We have a Nigerian, we have a Cameroonian, we have a Kenyan, Ugandan, people who speak the same languages, but a white man imposed a, an artificial boundary, making them different and separate. And so tribal wars ensued. Then colonization, because of that colonization, people started fighting, like we remember the Mao Mao and the UPC uprising in Cameroon and in Kenya. And then W.E.B. Du Bois and others who in the diaspora started the Pan-African Conferences in Manchester from 1900. 
pushing for the independence of Africa. Africa got the independence. Nkrumah said, look, Ghana is not independent until the entire African countries are independent. So we don't, it don't really mean anything to us. So he was actually spearheading the United States of Africa. Till today, nothing has happened. So that independent was a smoke screen independence. It was a pseudo independence because today we are in a neo-colonial state, in which case we speak European languages, we wear European clothing, we import food, water, drink, still from Europe. So dependency is actually our mother, not even our father, but our mother. So anything African is an anathema. Then the Chinese, I say this because I visit the continent every year. The Chinese are everywhere. Chinese institutes are in universities in Africa. So it's not only English and French and Portuguese, it's now Chinese language. Look at the fate of a people. We import even much. We import toothpicks. We import drinking water when River Nile has not dried up. So what is wrong with us? I go back to what I said. We shot ourselves on the foot and our toes is still hurting. We woke up from the wrong side of the bed. The question is why? How come this happened to us? Where are the warships on the sea in Africa made by Africans? Where are the warplanes made by Africans? So we don't even conquer the sea. We don't conquer the land. <laughs> This is the fate of Africa that I wanted to talk to you about. So if Africa wants to play a meaningful role on the universe, I don't even want to use the word universe. Universe, we are now in the metaverse. It's no longer uni one, it's the metaverse. With virtual communication, where we are in the virtual world like we are doing right now, and also in the in-person world. And so what Africans are trying to do now is to decolonize, de-neocolonize, and de-Westernize in order to gain back their dignity. A peaceful, loving people just to be the mother earth, and also in order to further their own progress in their own way. They were not given that chance right from the 146 BC that I was talking to you till today that China has now become the new neo-colonial master of Africa, buying lands in Africa, and our people are giving them those lands without thinking about a new generation. So the new generation of Africans will not even call themselves African or Africa or Adair Bulan, as I told you. They are actually going to be a mixture of nothing. Because being an African is not just to wear the clothing, it's not to speak the language, it's actually to be rooted rooted with Mother Earth. But is that possible? Why did we fall into this fit? Why did we fall into this fit that the whole world is laughing at our dependence? Look at what is happening in Ukraine. Look at the way Africans were treated in Ukraine. And it's not only in Ukraine, wherever on planet Earth when Africans are present, they are always the subsidiary. They are always given by the last consideration. Why? Because our dignity was trampled upon and we have done nothing to resuscitate from that dignity because we seem to embrace and hold firm what is in the West. And that is our tragedy. So the presence of an African in this metaverse, what you call universe, is still problematic. Read from Fanon's black skin, white mask. Read from Fanon's wretched of the earth. And you will see what I'm trying to say. We are all trying to be white. And if you are trying to be white, then what do you think about the statement by Julius Nyerere that when others are, are, are walking, Africans should run. But instead of running, we are crawling back to the village while the others are capturing the moon. What happened? 
I keep asking this question, was there any curse somewhere by nature that we were supposed to be this way? And that there's no unity even among us inter-tribal and inter-trade, not inter-tribal, inter-trade between African countries is this mal. I don't want to go into the statistics. Leaving one African country to another African country is problematic. So from trade even to travel, who placed that curse on us? Where is the source of that curse? This is what the ancestors have been asking. Chinua Achebero, things fall apart. Died 2013, things are still falling apart. So I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I wanted us to question this issue. What is the reality of reality in being an African? in this day and age of the metaverse, not just the universe. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you, guys. That was a powerful opening, Professor Kebuma Langme. <laughs> My brother. <laughs> so I'm not, I want the challenge. This is the, this is the way I like. I like this back and forth. I want questions. I want... I, am I too pessimistic? Am I too, uh, what? I lived on that continent. I was born on that continent and now I'm abroad. So I am looking at all the eyes from all the angles and I visit the continent every year. In fact, I'm living next month for three countries. I'm living for Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda as a visiting professor. And what I always see, my brother will see, is tears always coming down my eyes internally. Because you can imagine what will happen to me on the continent if I move physically with tears. Because what do I see? I see dependent, I see what Bali Mazuri used to say, the artificialities of the cities in Africa trying to imitate the cities in, in Europe and America. When, we, when our own exigencies, geopolitical, geosocial exigencies are different and unique by itself. And I prefer the rural. I always prefer the rural part of Africa when I fly. I like to go and see the Mother Earth, see how it was. I walk with the goats and the cows, and I feel the sea breeze because the city suffocates. The capital city, so why does it suffocate? Because we are trying to imitate. And like Sheikh Antadji used to say, nobody can ever develop by using the language of another person. Because language is a carrier of history and geography, and that is the fate of my continent, Africa. Over to you. Speaking of languages, I mean, there are over 3,000 ethnic groups and languages, if I, may add, if I may add, in Africa. If we were to go that route of finding a language, you know, what would be your proposal? How should we go about that? I mean, um, it's already challenging for Africans to speak their own native languages. Now you're asking that they should speak theirs and other African languages. How might we use that language, if I may ask? Okay, thank you so much for that question. Um, I always like to pause before I respond to a question of this nature. And I got that question thrown at me in Ghana, 2018, when I visited there as a keynote speaker. And my answer was very simple. If you start teaching Kishwahili in elementary school there in Accra, Ghana, will those kids send you out? If you start teaching Kishwahili, in Ghana, not even in Tanzania. I'm not even talking about where it originated. If you start teaching Kishwahili in elementary school, because those are the future of the continent, it's no longer us, we are gone. Will those elementary school kids send you away? No, they will be excited because the lad, LAD of a child can contain six, seven, eight languages. I myself, I speak six languages. My son here in America speaks only English language. He feels ashamed when I take him and he travels to Europe and America. And he said, Daddy, why don't they teach us other languages here in the United States? So if we start with Wolof, 
Kishwa Hili, Yoruba Easy Soxa. And we said, look, let us plan for the next 40, 50 years and our elementary school kids will start with uh, Kishwa Hili. Will that be a problem? If I'm not thinking about us again, we are done. We have sold the continent. We, we the adults. In fact, sometimes I ask myself, do we really, can we answer the questions of the new generation, those youth who are unemployed on the continent of Africa? Now, Kishwahili is an official language in East Africa. Does it mean they are not speaking English? They do speak English. But at least they've had the courage to make Kishwahili their official language. A fallback language. And my movement has always been and will continue to be that all Black race should speak Kishwahili. Let it be our own language of falling back. So when I meet my Black brother at the airport, or at the train station in London. Let's say, oh, Asante Sana. Huh? Let's say, Habari Zamchana, Habari Zaisubui. Because if we keep speaking the colonial language, a language that was imposed on us using brute force, brute force, and we have not taken it from our mind, and we are still using it in our African Union. That is the most insulting thing. An African union that was supposed to be an independent union, our African language are secondary. They're not even using them. We are using English and French. Why don't we do what other countries have done to decolonize languages? I don't want to go into the politics of which language, which language. Let's start, let's even start with anyone. Let's forget about our politics of I hate these people because they speak this language. That is an adult, I call it. Uh, I think it's adult HIV. What has the language done to you that you don't want to speak it because the people who use that language did this or that to you? It does not make sense to me. Let's start somewhere. That's my answer. Now, let's face it. I mean, the rate of adoption of a language is very low in Africa. One of the reasons you have cited um, is you know, the tribal te uh, tensions that we experience. Um, do you have a, a strategy, an approach to ease the minds of people so that we can start adopting Kiswahili as the African language? Because we will, need, we will need a strategy to make it happen. Of course, it has started. <laughs> it has already started. <laughs> when Kishwahili was already made official language, uh, those countries had already started teaching it. <laughs> so the teachers are there, the books are there. In Tanzania, in Uganda, in Congo, in Kenya. So just give ourselves 15 years. You will see the strategy. So it's already there. <laughs> it's there. So that's the strategy. <laughs> well, well. And and then another thing is that a lot of expatriates have started learning, like you see in America, we have Department of Swahili. We have it here at Howard University. And there, I don't want to tell about it, so many other departments that have a Swahili. And it, as I was telling you about metaverse in social media, there are so many translation now into Swahili <laughs> on most of the platforms. So it's growing, it, it will. So I, I don't have me any fear. The point is just to have the will to do it and the will will come. I will not come with our age. It will come with, with maybe the 12 years old and, and, and below. Shane, uh, are you there? I'd like to welcome you to ask um, some questions perhaps. You are on mute. Okay, hello, I'm Shanae. Yeah, Shanae, how you doing? <laughs> hey, I'm well, how about yourself? I'm doing great, I'm fine, Shanae. I'm fine. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so last week, um, Lent, she had she had spoken about cryptocurrency and that being the avenue, or at least being a key avenue for connecting Africans globally. What is something that you yourself feel that Africans can do to connect globally as well? Do you think it's learning language as you kind of talked about or? Oh, you want me to answer? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, talk away, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. I listen. 
I am not against anything that can restore our Africanness in the world. What I am against is waiting for things to happen in the West and then for us to imitate. That's still the dependency that I'm talking about. Have you asked your question, what has been done in Africa that the West are imitating? What has germinated from the soil of Africa, whether it is political, economic, or social, that the West are falling head over heels on it? If the answer is no, or if the answer is the raw materials that have been exploited from us, then we still fall back to what I talked about, dependency. Mm -hmm. So adopting cryptocurrency that we wait for Zuckerberg to come out with Facebook, then we create Facebook Africa, Facebook Swahili, Facebook this, huh? if, or Twitter, this Twitter. When we have our own digital platform that are germinating on the continent and we fail to promote. That is what I get. I go back again to Frank Fanon, black skin, white mask. There may be some advantages that cryptocurrency can do for the continent of Africa in order to promote Afrocentricity. What do I mean by Afrocentricity? Let Africa be the center. Let Africa call the shot. If you listen to me, I said, we don't control land, we don't control sea, and we don't control air. We don't. And so maybe that's where the idea of white supremacy or European supremacy comes about. So we need to look for something that make us us, something that can be the envy of the world. And there are many, there are many. Cornel West was telling me that, how can you marginalize African-American for 400 years and all they give to you is love, love with, upper, with capital L. They only love a group of people that have gone through lynching, gone through all kinds of terrorism, yet all they do is they give you love. Look at what was done to Kitanji Jackson. Somebody displaying intellect, yet white supremacy was still trying to drown her intellect as if it's a non-entity, that's nothing. So we, my issue is that let us not keep depending on something to germinate when then we look for uh, some um, ancillary, some similarities. Okay, let's do it this way. They will still control us. That's controlling the mind. Remember Thomas Sankara? Thomas Sankara said, he who fits you, controls you. He who fits you, controls you. <coughs> Listen to that statement. This is what angered the French in Burkina Faso. So because he wanted to Africanize, he wanted to decolonize. Of course, they had to sponsor coup d'etat. I don't want to go with the Lumumba and the rest. But we should not give in. We should look for a way. Because that is why Asians, that's why the Middle East, when, when I fly um, uh, uh, Emirates and I land in Dubai, everything there is from the Middle East point of view. You see the mosque, you see, or oh, everybody's dressed. No, no, listen, this is the language. Even on the elevator, my brother, Osiri, even on the elevator. What is wrong with us? And then you see our African brothers <laughs> running, cleaning the toilet. And <laughs> my sister, let me not go there. Uh, these are the things that bring tears to my eyes, okay? <laughs> Can you go ahead, ask a follow up before we yeah. go, go ahead. Now, as as like an African-American woman myself, what is something that I can do to connect to my African roots? Is it Excellent. educating myself in meetings such as this? Is it going to Africa myself? Uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, lay it down. <laughs> I need to know. And Shone, just to let you know, this is the second time <laughs> I am moving to, I'm, I'll be good, as I said, I'm moving to the continent as a visiting professor to three universities on the continent. And I'm living from Harvard University. And my colleague, Dr. Mwaka, in the Swahili department is taking African-Americans with him to learn and study Swahili at this same university that I'm going to in Kenya. Eh? Wow. This is the second time. The first time I was a visiting professor at the University of Boya, Cameroon. And I met again, Harvard University student, African-American Harvard University student from the Department of Engineering. And I addressed them. 
You know, I was so happy. The same, these ones that are going to this, I'll also be with them. So traveling is one. Two, the main thing is not just traveling, but the main thing is reading. And reading and rereading and decolonizing your mind as you read about the continent of Africa. You see, I started with 146 BC and I came right up to today. I'm yeah. telling you, how many of us can get, because for you to understand the continent of Africa, Shone, you need to have, you need to carry the back of history and history. Remember, history means H-E-R-S-T-R-O-Y, because you know the politics of history from a men's point of view, history from a woman's point of view, knowing that there were queens in Africa. So that when you visited them, you say, I want to visit the kingdom in, in Ghana, where the queens are ruling the people. Now your visit is meaningful. Right. So when you read this, and then this is the process of the decolonization of your mind, so that you are now realizing that this is what colonial, Arabic, and Chinese invasion of the continent of Africa have done to my people. So you come out, you write books, you now give keynote speeches all over, talking about how we need to win ourselves. Win is W-E-A-N, not W-I-N. Win ourselves on the claws of Europe and China. There's no other way out. It's not tourism. It's not tourism. It's not sitting at the beach. It's asking, well, then, then, how, do then, I improve, how do I improve my people? Improve the human condition. Improve the condition of my people. Are you with me now, Shane? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Good. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, you know, my students, my students at Howard University, I, of course, 90% of my students are African-Americans. And they always feel the club when I'm coming in because we start from there. Each time they say, oh, long, take me along, take me along. And I said, look, these are the pro, these are the project. This, like what I'm going to get is a memorandum of agreement with my university, study abroad program. A lot of my students are also going to Nigeria. A lot of my students are going. We are not saying students should not study in London and Paris, but start from your roots, brothers and sisters. Know right. thyself, know thyself. People have sacrificed and died for us. I don't want to go and start talking about all these W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass. I don't want to go back there because it brings tears to my eyes. All saying that know thyself before you know another person, another situation. And when you do that, then you now what? You grow now with your, you move about with your head tall. Your dignity is restored. Our dignity has not yet been restored. Why? Because we are, we, we seem to crave the idea of dependency. We seem to crave the secondary role that they've given to us. Look at the names we carry. Shone, look at the names we carry. Listen to my name. My name is Kebuma Langmir. Kebuma means, as my father told me, that when war is coming, I receive with my left hand. Langmir means I'm being surrounded by friends and foes. So my father deleted the baptism name, Christian baptism name Vincent, that my mother imposed. My, my father said, I don't know the source of that name. Why would I give a name to my son, my flesh and brother? I don't know the history. Maybe it's, an, maybe it's a curse name. What? And you see, in most of our brothers and sisters, they have Emmanuel, they have Victor, they have Joseph. They, are, they don't even know the meaning. Our Arab brothers carry Abdul, not knowing that Abdul means son of a slave. You see the fate in which we find ourselves? We have a lot of work, my dear Shoni. We have a lot of work. To clean, and when you have a lot of work, you walk into a room, they say, Wow, that's an African dignity, that's an African queen. And king. people will sit down, they'll listen to you. And that is what I'm doing in my books. That is what I'm doing in my books. Google me, get my books, read. I all my 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 prayer is that before I kiss the dust, before I meet the ancestors, I should go and give them an answer that I did my best. I should tell Ali Mazuri. Chinu Achebe, you people gave us the mantle. We did not sell the continent. Thank you, Shoni. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> then more questions. Yes, uh, Dr. Ariri, go ahead, please. Uh, Dr. Langmuir, oh, Professor Langmuir. No, no, you can see, just call me Langmuir. What is in the name, my sister? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Wow. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your fire. 
about this Thank issue. Um, yeah, I find myself somewhere there. And uh, so what you're doing right now to me is just, you know, getting me all worked up about our situation. Um, I feel, I mean, when you look at uh, the historical context that Africa once upon a time led civilization. Uh, and when I think about even my own trajectory as a, a person, when I came to the United States, I was the envy of many people. And you look back and you realize it's for the wrong reasons. Good. Um, and yeah, so we've taken away also from our continent and it's sad when we think about it. And uh, in some ways you feel trapped in this cycle, you know, once, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know what even I'm, I'm trying to say, but then uh, the question I want to ask you is, I think there is some kind of awakening. We are asking the right questions. We have probably not a critical mass, but people who are starting to, who are really getting fired up. The new generation, you know, like Shanae's, uh, and many others are seem to be even more um, more ready for a little bit more than you know they are questioning more than we did for us it was like yeah I'm in America etc. Um, so do you think that something is happening and maybe one day, hopefully soon that we might be the next people that are leading the world, or at least at the same place with everybody else? My sister, mm -hmm. this is a very good question. And I would like to go back to your insinuation of the civilization that will lead the world. If you go back and you read about the University of Sankore, Around 1665, we were leading the world in the universities, in the University of Sankore, in Timbuktu. Look at the pyramids. You know, Ali Mazuri says, the Taj Mahal in India is a love poem in marble, but the pyramids is immortality in steel. Meaning that what? That pyramids constructed by whoever kind of engineering technology without any education from the West, if they could come up with something like that, my sister, with cities, go to Ethiopia, as I'm talking to you, you'll be amazed with the Orthodox church, things that were constructed underground by our brothers and sisters from the continent. So the talent was there, the envy of the world. We let the world, but we let the ball drop. Why? Because when we took independence 60 years ago, and again, going back to one crew and the Nyerere, they were saying, we started accusing each other for power mongering. Why? Because the West got into it and divided us because they didn't want us to maintain that supremacy. They did not. So they had to get in between us now in order for us to fight ourselves. But as you say, the reawakening is coming. Why? Because people are going back now to realize the errors of the past and to reassert their personality, to reassert the dignity of the, the black person. Remember what Tony Morrison said? Tony Morrison was asked a question about <clears throat> her novels and why does she not write about the mainstream meaning about white people? She writes only about black people. And she said, all what she did was not to have the white gaze to be dominant in her work. Tony Morrison, she tried to bring the life of African-Americans to show to the world that these are people with dignity and with love. But all what you're doing is to suffocate them, not for them to grow. You did that. And that is why she got the Nobel Prize. Now, how do we then do that for ourselves? We should not drop the ball by always accepting the lower status wherever we go. That's my problem. Let's continue to accept that look, black is beautiful. I know only beautiful, but black is intelligent. 
I don't want to go to Seda Sengon negritude. I want to embrace M.S. Cezaire. M.S. Cezaire said that, in fact, the idea of decolonization is supposed to even be more with Europe than with Africa. And that is the same thing that Jean-Paul Sartre said, writing the preface in from Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, that Europe needs to decolonize more than Africa. Because they use brute force. You cannot use brute force in the name of civilization of a people. So never say you, you imported or exported. No, you imported civilization to the people. No, you imported brute force. And that's not what civilization is all about. So you yourself, you need to decolonize. You need to be civilized. So the colonizer is the one that needs redemption. So I agree with you. There's a movement going on. <laughs> I see it everywhere. But let us redouble our efforts. Like what I have chosen to do, my sister, is not just wear this African dress. That's not all I do. I publish my books. And if a publishing house says, I'm not going to publish it because you are trying to promote the dignity of the Black person, I move to another publisher. And then I go to the continent as a visiting professor in order to bring my knowledge to the people. Since I don't have money, but my own money is the knowledge I'm giving to my people on the continent. I do that every year at least. I go twice to the continent to give the knowledge because Bernard Follon said the only way Africa is going or black people are going to get away from the chains that are on their feet is through knowledge and capital. Knowledge, knowledge. Look at Kitanji Johnson. I, I talk again about Kitanji. She displayed knowledge before the eyes of the world. And now she's at the Supreme Court, a slave at the Supreme Court. <laughs> that made my day, my brother Osiris. That was my day. And then why did it also make my day? The idea of women emancipation, a women colonization, patriarchy. All those now were resolved. Men will no longer be taking women for granted again. They will not. The women will point to Kitanji. They will point to Kamala Harris. You know, we will all sit up and then Europe will now relax and say, oh, we made a mistake. Reparation may be the next discussion. <laughs> Reparation. Thank you. I don't know that I answered your question. I don't know. Go ahead, please, uh, Dr. Ariri. If you have a follow up, you're more welcome to. This is an open discussion. Um, again, we, we like the Q&A format that uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kibuma Langmia has offered. Yeah, offer. I think it's more effective. Think it's more effective. You, you are mute. Sorry, oh, okay. So I'll ask, I'll ask another question. Uh, yes, yes. Professor Langmia. So are you able to measure, and not in quantitative terms, really, but to measure your effectiveness in giving the people knowledge in Africa. One of the frustrations I I have with people at home, you know, because I'm sure like many of you who are from uh, uh, diaspora, like more recent immigrants, you are in a ton of WhatsApp groups. And, uh, like especially when George Floyd died and we had this huge reawakening and it was, you know, it was a global um, phenomenon. Um, people in Kenya were not getting it because I was on fire and I'm sending forwards and I'm texting and, you know, like really thinking that we, even they are seeing there's something here. And most people would be like, oh, wow. So anyway, how is the family? And so I was so, disappointed by that and these are people who are scholars i mean people who are who i respect who are intelligent uh so i'm, I'm wondering how you experience that you know when you go and um support people with knowledge 
Okay, thank you, my sister. And by the way, I'm going to Daystar University in Kenya. So I'll be in. Oh, you're going to Daystar. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, you, I call that university because that's the university where this is the second time I'll be going there. 2016 were there. And majority of the students who come and present at our conference is the International Communication Association Conference. Uh, they come from Daystar and also University of Nairobi. But I have noticed a change. I have noticed a change. One, the topics they are selecting to present, <laughs> you know? Because when I came out, I started with Jomo Kenyatta. I told about Ngugi wa Thiongo, you know? <laughs> Decolonizing the man, I said, hey, don't betray us. Don't be that laid back. You need to move with the time. And coming back to the issue of the George Floyd, give them time. The effect on the African was dire. The colonial effect was, and now China has come again. So we are like an experiment. The African is an experiment. Each time the African wants to, uh, to get out, to resurrect, there is another thing that pounces on, and our leaders are not making things better. The leaders are not doing anything better. So another thing that I did to measure, you talk about measurement. When I teach at Makerere University, the first time I went there, I said, look, don't be harvesting all these theories from the West and planting them on the soil of Africa. It will not germinate. The theories you are using for your research, ask yourself, the founder of that theory or the assumptions of that theory, what has that got to do with the market women there in Kampala city or in the village? If it does not hold them, use grounded theory or use Afrocentric theory. That's why I came out with a book, Black Africana Critical Theory. I have the book outside there. So I walk the walk and I talk the talk. So, and I said, when you get them, now you, so I started changing their mindset that if you are dealing with an, a phenomenon or phenomena, which is Africa, Africanize it. So the idea of Afrocentricity, I actually bring it to their forefront and they see it with themselves. Because I said, these people that you are trying to imitate, they don't care. But why should they even care? When you've not even cleaned, you've not even cleaned your threshold, your door, why will you want to move to another place so far? So you first of all need to think about yourself. So that's how I've been able to measure. And the other thing that I've been able to measure is the publications that are coming from the continent. So whenever I go down and I say, well, uh, it's not only going to the conferences, but the kind of books you are writing, the topics you are selecting. So um, I have edited, my books are now about 16, 17, and most of the chapters from my folks from the continent of Africa, oh, you need to read it, oral literature, oral history, the jujus, eh? and the importance of the temples, <laughs> you know, and the role of women. Oh, read Egodi, Egodi, my sister in Nigeria. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They are bringing all those things now back. So I'm happy. <laughs> That's how I measure it, my sister. <laughs> Thank you for that response. Uh, Nina, I believe you have a question. Are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. I go am on, here. Go ahead and, and fire away. I'm so sorry that I can't be online at the moment because the, my environment is not OK. No problem. Nina. Thank you so much, Professor Kebuma. And I don't know, you've just wowed me and made me speechless. <laughs> and of a truth, <laughs> and of a truth, of a truth. Yes. I think a doctor needs to be here to, to check my heart because it is <laughs> taken seriously. That's a truth. It is palpitating seriously, it's throbbing. Oh. And this is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an outcry that Africans need to hear. It is to be out there. Thank you so much, Professor. No problem. So no. concerning this rape of Africanism, because the rate of, of, of what we're passing through has edged deep. It has gone through our marrows. Even the new generation we are bringing are also assimilating it. Yes, we have Africans that are rising up in tune to decolonize. But my question is, is it possible judging how far and deep we have been, is it possible for, for this to happen? Is it really possible? Because when you are trying, it's just like crabs that are in a bucket. When one, try, when one of it tries to come up, you see another one bringing it down. When one tries to come out, you see another one bringing it down. So Prof, is it really possible 
because <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm a woman and I know what is really happening in Africa. I'm in Nigeria at the moment and it bleeds my heart. And hearing from you, I can easily re relate. I can easily, easily relate. And uh, please just answer this. With this, okay, I can okay, now. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Nina, let me start with uh, the speech that was given to us by, um, um, oh, why am I forgetting his name? The most pop, the most published published African on planet Earth. Uh, well, is it? It's not too much of it, no. No, 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 no. He's a Yoruba. He's alive, my brother. <laughs> oh, is it Fasola? Yes. No, no, no. no. Uh, 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 yeah. Austin. Well, yeah, UT Austin. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, he's in UT Austin. What's his name? It's Fasola now. No. No. Give me the full name. Give me the full name. Falola, yes, Falola. Falola, Falola, yeah, Falola. <clears throat> Toyin Falola. If I don't call it Toyin Falola, I don't feel comfortable. Okay. But Toyin Falola is the most published African on planet Earth with 100 books and counting. When he came to Howard University, Nina, I attended his lecture in African Studies Department. And he made mention of the fact that there is no fashion parade in Nigeria that is worn by a black lady. It's, all, it's only worn by a lady that has applied cream to her body to look fair, to look like a white woman. He also mentioned the idea of the hair and the teeth. We are taking everything from everybody except us. And that is a metaphor of how we see ourselves. When he made mention of that statement, I had to go back again to all my visit in Africa. People have been persecuted for not speaking English correctly, but nobody is being persecuted for not speaking Kishwahili or Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa correctly. So it is deep. I agree with you that brainwashing was deep. And I don't only use the word brainwashing, I also use the word brain dry cleaning. But there is still hope. Because since we were not cloned, right from 400 years of slavery, and African Americans are still reacting with the word love, and Africans are still welcoming to strangers, including Chinese, there is hope for us. But we need to resuscitate from our slumber. And the only way for us to resuscitate from our slumber is for us to start making individual choices. When I talk about decolonization, starting with language, it also starts not only, only with our clothing, but it starts with the kind of thing that you choose to do. The kind of thing you import to your continent, the kind of houses you build, promotion of natural grown food from our people, not importing drinking water from Europe. And this can be done with platforms. Whenever we're on the radio, whenever we are publishing, whether we are teaching, or when we find ourselves, we have cousins and nephews who are ministers. Yeah. This thing can be done, but we need to make baby steps. The, the other day I was in Uganda, and a friend was asking me, are you from Nigeria? I said, what if I say yes, what happened? Oh, no, no, we don't like 419. We don't like Nigeria. I said, you see, African hating African. This is the beginning of the problem we have. So I said, I don't, I don't even want to use the name of my country because the name was imposed by Portuguese, which means shrimp, which is Cameroon. I don't want, and my country has not had the courage to change that name. So you see where we are? It will happen, but it will take a lot of mindset. Mindset. When my wife gave birth to my son, he said, let's just maintain my name to my son. My wife said, no, let me impose Brandon. Let me impose a middle name. I said, I tried to decolonize the mind of my wife, but I did not succeed. <laughs> Why? Because my wife is a Christian. If I bring the discussion of Christianity and all the blindness or the religious dust that we all carry, and I go back to 146 BC, oh, my marriage will be rocked. Why? Because of the extent of brainwashing. The extent. 
Look at, look at the plethora of all churches on the continent of Africa. Most of the countries that are rising on the world, they are they're actually atheist countries. I was shocked when I lived in Germany and I went to a church, it was, it was completely empty. On a Sunday, my brother was sitting. People were at the beach. People were at the beach. I'm giving you facts. And then it dawned on me, I said, hey, wait a minute. Are these not the missionaries? Are these not the people who care a lot? What is going on here? But you can fool some of the people some of the time. You cannot fool all the people all the time. That is what I keep saying. So let's not relent. It will happen. One day it will happen. But let them see it. Let them see the action in us. Let us see. And there was a conference in Eritrea. Let me end by saying there was a conference in Eritrea by African scholars in 2000 where they wanted to really emphasize the idea of African languages to be used in all aspects of science and technology on the continent. The Eritrea conference is still relevant here today. But look at how long it took the African Union to include the Swahili and Isisoxa as part of the official languages of the AU. But go to their website, go to the AU website as I'm talking to you, mostly in English and French, but we will get there. Let's not relent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Um, just one more question, please. Yes, my brother, my sister, my sister, Nina. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, my sister. Thank you. Yes. I like it because um, that's an African name, so I'm calling it with a lot of love and <laughs> attachment. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, what, uh, my next question is, um, you said, and I agree with you, it is beyond wearing these African clothes, yeah. wearing of um, hair, making African hair. So I would like to ask what happened to our morals and ethics? How do we decolonize that as well? And instill it upon this new generation we have now because truly we have failed because this new generation we are bringing are the one that will foster um, the new Africa we are clamoring for. How can we do that? Is there any strategy for this? Excellent question. And this is the most difficult question that I have. And let me tell you why. I left here, my brother Osiri went to attend a traditional festival in my village before the pandemic. I know what, when we came there, we the Americans were the ones that were being worshipped. But we the Americans knew nothing about that culture. And in fact, because of the money, because of the power of the dollar, I could see how we were actually defiling tradition. I'm telling you. The chiefs and all, they were the one inviting us. And all those that grew up seeing, the elders that I grew up as a little baby, they were at the background. They were, they were not being listened to. Why? Because they didn't have the power of the dollar. So the ethics and moral that you're talking about, you are hitting the nail on the head. It is true. It is really true. See all the images on WhatsApp. Anything that happens in Washington, oh, people already in my village, they know it even before I know it here. So the idea of brain drain, brain gain, it's only brain gain that we can really resolve the issue of brain drain and brain washing. Because if we are the precursors to say, look, we still have to respect, morally speaking, respect our elders and our seniors because Chino Achebe said, what a, a, a young man can see standing up, an elder person will see is sitting down. Yes. Meaning that the fact that you are tall does not mean that you know anything. You still have to listen to your elders. In fact, that actual saying is, what an elder can see sitting down, a young man cannot see standing up. That's the quotation. And since I'm with Achebe, I still want to say what he said, that if, 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 if lions don't write their own history, the story of the, the horn will only glorify the hunter. So that's why I'm writing our history. Our morals are downward because we are imitating what is happening in Europe and America. We only want to make sure we measure every success by what is coming from there. And so we have refused, we've disobeyed our, our elders who have a lot of wisdom about good life, about honor, about dignity, respect. Now is the power of money that speaks. Just because I, 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 I send container that they should build this, 
I cannot buy somebody's plot when I don't even own that plot. I don't own that plot. I'm not knowing that there were some rituals that were done on that plot of land. But since I'm sitting in America and I have a lot of dollars, I can defy tradition. You see ethics and morals? You see the effect? But that can be done again if our leaders are not corrupted. The issue of corruption is really, really endemic on this issue of success. And part of it is because of poverty, Nina. It's poverty. And poverty imposed by those who took over power and tried to imitate and live also in bungalows like the white people were living in bungalows on the continent of Africa, right in fashion uh, 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 cars. When I go to the continent, I see it. I see the most expensive cell phones are owned by Africans on the continent of Africa. Not to talk of the cars. But we cannot stop doing this because each time I go, I cannot stop preaching that we still have to come back to our ethics and morals, respect the elders, listen to our mothers, listen to our elder sisters, listen to the wisdom of the people, because that is what is going to take us away from the superficialities of westernization. These are the superficialities of westernization. Do you know that I have a name to call my sister who is... Uh, who is my elder sister in the village? It was given to me by my mother. No, you have to respect, you need to call her that name. And I still call that name to you today. But my son calls me my first name. That's, that's morals. And when I go there, I still wash my hands, Nina, and eat with my fingers. How many of us do that? We speak differently, we emit a foreign accent. We dress in Western dresses and go into, into traditional ceremonies in our villages in Africa. We do that. Why? We, because we have still been colonized by that issue of primitivity. I say, read, read Black Skin, White Mass. I have a copy here by Frank Fanon. What is wrong with us? And yeah, we call ourselves human beings. So let's not stop. We'll not stop preaching for this to happen. Thank you, Nina. I really like those. These are excellent questions you already posed. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm also interested in your theory book. How can I get it, please? Okay. Um, it is everywhere, of course. It's on Amazon, but it, it could be more expensive. But uh, when you go through, go through Osiri, get to my email, and I'll be able to send you a copy. Great. <laughs> Yeah, give Thank me you my so much. yeah, yeah. That's the only way I have the continents. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Someone wants to, I think Dr. Ariri wants to uh, know what exactly is brain gain. Did you say okay. anything about brain, brain gain? gain. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, brain drain. Of course, we are out of the continent. I live here in North America. I'm here in the United States. I teach at Howard University. The university in Cameroon will call that kind of process brain drain, meaning that I have not used my brain on the continent of Africa or on the universities in Africa, but I am instead using it here in the West. Now, what I've done with brain gain, and this is actually a study done by my Ugandan student. This was the whole research, is to go back. Now I gain, I go back, you know, and I give back the knowledge and I give not only kind, any kind of knowledge anyway, Afrocentric knowledge and the books. So that brain gain. Now, had it been I didn't come here and expose myself to the global world, it's not the global, it's not just America, but the global world. I have colleagues and writers from India, from China, from Middle East, from Indonesia. So we exchange ideas. Now I'll take it back to the continent. So that's brain game. <laughs> that's a theory of brain, yes. That's brain game, yes. Thank you. Chene. Mm -hmm. Oh. Hey there, are you able to hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> I swear that question probably gets asked in so many Zoom meetings around yeah. the world. Can you oh. hear me? Okay. <laughs> but so when I think about Africans and connecting to the universe, I immediately looked at it from a spiritual perspective. Do you look at it that way? And if so, what? how can we connect to that spiritually? Thank you, my dear Shana. There's a difference between spiritual and religious. Do we agree on that? being spiritual and being right religious. exactly uh, i thought of it immediately from a spiritual yeah, perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. so i was curious what your take on that is yes. if you read john Beatty, john Beatty, africans are the most spiritual creatures on planet earth and their spirituality did not come with christianity it came prior to christianity 
Because they will look up at the sun and they will know that somebody is watching them and they become so honorable. So spirituality, they look at their ancestors, those who have passed to the other world that they are watching on them. Listen, that they are watching on them. So they build that world. They, try, they will try as much as possible to be on the right side of history. Oh, the ancestors are worshipped on the continent of Africa. So people really want to be on the right side, do things that are right, because they believe that the ancestors will come in the middle of the night and choke them. <laughs> yes. So you, 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 a, a good example would be, okay, don't, 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 don't defile. Don't go out with somebody's wife just because you think that you will go free. No, no, no. The ancestors will, will hammer you. They will get you the punishment. So that's spirituality. <laughs> yes, this is spirituality. So when I think of, of course, decolonization, I don't even want to go that far. I only see by religion. You know, I see that, okay, there's Christianity, there's Arabic, there's Chinese, whatever thing. I'm not worried about that because I know Africans are spiritual people. My only worry is that this sometimes, somehow, at certain point, especially the young people, they think that the African spiritual wealth that brings about honor, dignity, and respect is no longer valuable. So they will like the Bible. They will like to read John chapter this or Matthew chapter this, or they will read the Hadith by Muhammad and think that that's more important than the spiritual African religion, so to speak. That's my fear. And um, But John Beatty and many other writers have already said that, look, the African person is a spiritual human being by birth. No, 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 by birth. And you know that it is that part of that African spirituality that really helped African-Americans here yeah. from 1619, if you read Hannah Jones, uh, the 1619 project, spirituality was not even just religion, but spirituality, swing low, sweet chariot. Although it was not only the heavenly father, but the ancestors of Africa. They were looking for a way, looking for a way to have some kind of, of harmony, harmony and peace in their life. And so that's what they came from Africa and it really helped them. And so each time that they were congregating on Sunday, they were actually jubilating the Africanness from a religious and from a spiritual point of view. So that is, that is the way I see it. But these other ones, they just come in and they preach there, they try to superimpose, but we try to fight as much as possible from the books as I was telling you. That's the way to deal with it. Now, and I'm sorry, you said the 1619 project? Mm -hmm. Oh, is that what it was called? Yeah, yeah, please Google the 1619. Yeah, I want to look into that. Yeah, the professor is in my university. You remember, oh, she's very famous. It, that was what uh, uh, um, Ted Cruz was uh, asking uh, Kitanji uh, John Jackson at the Supreme Court hearing about the 1619 project and the critical race theory. You know, you know all the saga about critical race theory and the 1619 project. Those are books that any African worthy of the name should read, should actually have, like I have it here. Everything is at my back here. My 1619 project, this is it. <laughs> this is it, this 1619 project. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, there you go, yeah. Yeah, the first, the, first, the first Africans who came here in Virginia in 1619, the first time African came here. If you don't read books like this, how do you then talk as a, how do you then bring your dignity as the African, as I was telling you, my dear Shane? These are like my Bible. These are my Bible. I've read it from cover yeah. to cover. I read it cover to cover. And sometimes I start from page one again. Again. You know? My sister is, we, we have problems. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so the mm -hmm. brain gain. Yes. There's so many of us here, so many. <laughs> and <Yeah>. we <laughs> and our green cards are processed quickly. Yes. So unlike those who might, I mean, those who might benefit more are the ones who are sent back before they even um, experience the American dream, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so how, because you've done it, Dr. Osiri is doing it with, you know, this work he's doing with Osiri University and Marvel. Mm -hmm. How can we organize ourselves uh, collectively mm -hmm. and uh, make a bigger impact? Because there's many of us. I mean, you're doing remarkable work. 
you're very, very driven, but there are many people who might need a little bit of, hey, something organized, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's uh, the question I have. How can we do that? Is there an initiative out there? Are you thinking of something like that? Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm also thinking also in terms of even African-Americans, because there's also an awakening there that at the end of the day, we are brothers and sisters and we are divided just for the purpose of divide and conquer or whatever, you know, so there's all that. Yeah, so how can we all come together as a people who are here and, you know, change our continent? Good. Uh, I'm just on my computer trying to type a group that you already need to also have. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. When you, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you are familiar with Molefi Kete Asante. Are you guys familiar with Molefi Kete Asante? He's the most published African American on planet Earth. Molefi Kete Asante of Temple University, Department of Africology. Mm. So there is an Afrocentric center and we have lectures like this every other Sunday at 4 p.m. <laughs> so they have oh, a movement. Oh. Yes, I want you to check that out and join us. <laughs> in fact, I mentioned, uh, Osiri is not there now, but I mentioned Osiri University in one of the lectures and everybody was Googling and going to that site. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a calendar when you go to the Afrocentric center, it's just Temple University, Maleficator Santi, Afrocentricity Center, you see their program, you see their calendar, look at the topics. In fact, most of these things I'm talking about, people have topics like mine in different, mm -hmm. all parts of it. They start from the Caribbeans. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, people speak from Jamaica, from Trinidad, Nigeria, Africa, Paris. These are all movements that we've been dealing with. In fact, I spoke there on my other book that I wrote, Black Lives and Digiculturalism. I spoke there, I think it was November, you know. So they always have this lecture online right now and people tune in from all over the world. It's really growing by leaps and bounds. Again, just trying to promote this issue that we, you and I were talking about since we're in the diaspora dealing with the issue of the brain gain. The, uh, how did I know about a Siri? I knew about Siri by Googling because I wanted to find out which institutions are outside there dealing with most of the things that we preach. So I came across a Siri, got in contact with uh, my brother here, and he put me as an elder. And each, since then, I've been talking about this university. In that forum, in fact, I talked about that and most of those students were taken. And then when I went for a keynote speech at Temple University, I met students in Africology, African-American and African studies from all parts of the world. And we're dealing with our own. So the idea of the, the Swahili movement I was talking to is something that is growing gradually, but it's really supposed, is now going to gain a lot of ground in the next 15 years because the teachers are there and the books are there and the curiosity is there, especially from the students. So that's one that I have in mind, but they are taunt. Mulana Karenga, you should know about Mulana Karenga, Kakaweda. Uh, These are people that are dealing with things and they also have movements. Uh, and then of course, uh, Toyin Falola with his conference in UT Austin. Every now and then, I think once or twice a year, people come from all over the world. So this thing is like, just get in contact with them and then you'll be part of it. But again, start with this four o'clock uh, meeting every other Sunday and listen to experts in most of these areas that I'm talking to you about. I'm also an elder in that group. <laughs> yeah. So are you fine? Are you fine? Hmm? I said, are you fine now? Are you good? Are you good? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Um... Yeah, I'm also thinking in terms of how this translates to practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, yeah. you asked that question. You asked me what, what I do on the continent and how can we measure the progress? And I already told you. And see, let me give another example that will shock you. You know, on the continent, people pride themselves by sending their kids to international schools or European French speaking. Oh, my, all the, where the ambassadors are sending their kids, that's where you also send your own kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not against that, but what I keep telling them, before you send the kids there, 
let the kid, first of all, pass through an Afrocentric school. Let them speak the languages. When I went to the city, I think it was in Kampala, I was talking to one of the professors. When I came home and the kids were greeting me in English, and I tried a little bit of the language, the Buganda, the kids would not respond. And so we had a discussion on that. And that parent told me from there that the next day he's going to start putting those kids in Buganda language schools before they will now get into all these international schools. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, how did I even get this pain? When I organized social media conference here at Howard University, my African-American brother told me a story that really ripped my heart asunder. And what was it? He said, when they moved to Nairobi as a family to study, they were very, very excited because they thought that their child would now learn African culture, African ways of life, tradition, education, curricula. But guess what? People were sending their children back to British schools, <laughs> French school. <laughs> now, it's, so he said they had to send the child back to Chicago to study Africa from Chicago. Can you imagine? It's, look at the painful thing that we, we Africans on the continent don't even embrace the African culture that much. That an African-American who really wants to understand Africa will come to the continent of Africa and instead see us gravitating towards our colonial masters. Mm -hmm. See the pain in it. We troop the embassies. Look at the mass immigration. People are in the Sahara, as I'm talking to you now, looking for ways to fly. Why? Because not that Africa is not rich, simply because of greed of our leaders, not to at least give uh, opportunities to people. There are people on the continent who pay school fees and tuition to students in schools in America and, 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 and Europe and China. And you, you want to find out why? Hmm? I don't want to tell you about most of the traditional African meetings I attend here, where even when I start the meeting with uh, Ubuntu or whatever, nobody wants to respond. Instead, they want to speak the English. And then when they want to speak the English, it's not even coming out well. And I said, where do we belong, my sister? No, honestly. Somebody who has a microphone at the wedding party, I said, what the heck is going on? Huh? So we are still the mulattoes of the world. You know, we are still in the middle. We don't know whether we are left or right. So, but we who are the pathfinders, we who are the movers and shakers, we who are the eyes of the blind, we need to be doing this thing that my brother Osiri is doing in order to reawaken people from slumber. And that's what I love about it. No, you need to see wherever I speak, wherever I talk about, people always come to me sometimes in tears. I remember in Ghana, one professor came to me, said, look, I was educated in Wisconsin. I was taught this is a theory. I was taught this kind of textbook and that's what I'm using here. But now you've opened my eyes. I'll no longer do that again. Part of it, we are not publishing. We are not writing. What do you expect them to do? Our students don't even quote us. African students don't even quote us. Why do you want to blame them? Because they have not pushed the curriculum of what we are doing. Huh? I stand on the line at the, at, 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 at the airport in Nigeria. And uh, the security guard is saying, oh, Nigerians should be on the left, or Africans on the right. Then I stay with the white on the right. Then the man mocks at me, not knowing that I hold an American passport, because the whites are the ones that should be moving quickly. <laughs> you know? And so when I finish, I, I call the guy and I tell him that, look, be very careful, my brother. Be very, very careful the way you belittle Africans here. Be very, very careful. And again, we have to learn how to get out of this, you know? And if you read uh, Ama Mazama, Ama Mazama said when he was in Cote d'Ivoire, he met uh, somebody who was trying to create a school and he wanted to call that school Montesquieu, blah, blah, elementary school. He said, do you know that Montesquieu owned slaves in France? They got, eh? <laughs> Montesquieu. So you keep calling all these French philosophers not even knowing their background, my sister. He said he owned slaves. So you are sitting here in Africa and you're extolling a white person who demean Africans. And you don't want to name that school Kwame Nkrumah school in Cote d'Ivoire. That was a baptism of fire to that gentleman. That day, that guy was baptized. He was baptized. <laughs> but little, I, I am telling you, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, to tell you another painful, this is really a painful example. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine that we grew up with, went and studied Chinese in China, went back to Cameroon. And now what is he doing? He's teaching Chinese to people there in Cameroon. So I asked him on WhatsApp, my brother, why are you teaching Chinese? He said, <laughs> I want to survive. 
<laughs> do so you will come back to my Chinese language. They will not come to Mungaka. Mungaka is the language I speak. He said, if I open Mungaka language, nobody will come there, brother. So I open Chinese to let them know they can go to China and people come there. And I sat here, my wife and I will start a swim. <laughs> Yeah. Has to survive. He has to survive. Yeah. We have a lot. We, all of us, all of us, not only me talking to you guys, all of us have a challenge in our hands. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, so speaking. Yes. Go speaking ahead, go ahead. of speaking of China, it's so discouraging that they've taken over Africa. What, yes. in your opinion, what's our future? Good. Because I know they are, they threaten, you know, they they use airports and uh, seaports for collateral. Good. You see, I was taking a book, my article I wrote here. This was way back in 2011, and this is the title of that article: "The Secret Weapon of Globalization: China's Activities in Sub-Saharan Africa" by Kebuma Lamia. That was me. I wrote this in 2011. Oh wow! Wow. And when I went to Ghana, my sister, mm. for I think it was the Global South Conference, we were in um, Elmina Resort. <clears throat> so I was on a panel and I made reference to this article that I wrote in this uh, journal. And one Chinese really got angry at me. That no, they are in Africa for business purposes. I said, my brother, you need to know your history very well. Business and politics, those are the two devils on planet Earth. What have they done in order to get those businesses? Have you researched that very well? <laughs> Do you know the amount of money they are pumping? Read what happened to Magufuli in Tanzania and the Chinese. So there are a lot of things that we just need to be researching to find out. The, what we can do is just, as I said, to conscientize the minds of our people in Africa about the dangers of China. What else can we do when our leaders all go to Beijing and they come out with all the Chinese money and they want to build glass houses? What do you think we can do? Our people will only resist if at least we open their eyes. And that's what we are trying to do. What else can we do? I cannot be Christopher Kigbo to, take, to leave my pen and take the gun and go to the war front. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. The word is the, like to, to imitate or not to imitate, to quote Paul Coates. Paul Coates says, we writers, we, use, we should use um, words, our words should be the bullets that will kill ignorance. That's Paul Coates. Use words as bullet to kill ignorance because knowledge is everlasting. So you will, you will be amazed in the next 30, 35 years, we may not, we may be, asking a different kind of question <laughs> on this issue. Yeah, because I tell you, the reawakening is there. Look at what is happening in Mali. They're sending away France. Did we ever think that Malians would do that to France? We never thought about that. <laughs> look at what happened in Rwanda. Go to Rwanda, look at what happened with France there. So these are, these are little drops, little drops of water makes a large ocean. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and what happened to the Caribbean with the Kate and William. That was good to, to, to observe. Yeah. So what we are doing is fine. That's why I like this university. That's why I like this lecture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine this lecture being listened or watched by so many people. Imagine like you were saying the effect of what I'm talking to you, how it is getting on you or what Shone is saying. Multiply that, multiply it to other people. So it's coming, it's coming, you know? <laughs> and one of the, the Afrocentric lecture I was telling you, one lady was discussing on dreadlocks, that if you wait, don't even use the term dreadlocks, the person who gave that term dreadlocks, that you, to dread means to be afraid of your locks. No, you should be proud of your lock of hair. So don't even call that word dreadlocks. I said, huh? I'm also learning. <laughs> <laughs> My sister, so we even replace the words that we use. <laughs> we, even the words we use, you think twice before you use that word because it may be an insult to you. That's, I, that's why I started with the name. I, say, I, I know my name. 
And when I'm pronouncing my name to the critical company or to the bank, I, I don't say, my name is Keboma Lenia. I don't, I say Keboma Langmia. <laughs> so if you want, I will spell it. <laughs> Because that's how my father called the name, my brother. Said, that's how my mother called the name. Why would I use a European accent to pronounce my name? Huh? Chai! Russians don't do that. Germans don't do that. Chai, why? what is wrong with us Africans, man? Why? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, more of, I just forgot today. Each time I want to start a lecture like this, I always start and ask for an apology from the ancestors for using the colonial language to talk to my people. I just forgot. I always start by apologizing to them that please forgive me that I'm using the colonial brute force language to talk to my people instead of using Kishwahili, Wolof, uh, Yoruba, or Hausa. But again, I need that apology so that my ancestors will not crucify me when I transition to the other world when the time comes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how long will you keep me? I'm getting hungry, my brother. I'll see you. OK, <laughs> I think we, we can start winding down. Any other questions uh, before we? We don't want to just hang out for the sake of it. Shanae, go ahead, please. Oh, no, I didn't have any questions. I just yeah. wanted to hop back on. All right. How about <laughs> Tim? Tim, you have any questions? OK. I think we, we can go ahead and, um, and wrap you. up. Thank you. Thank if there are no other questions. Uh, OK, Thank Tim you. is on now. Um, <laughs> Tim, do you have a question? You can, you can unmute and ask. I don't have any questions. I just want to tell uh, the professor to thank you for, um, you know, uh, blessing us with his time. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so that, much. That makes my day. So let me, you know what I'm going to eat today? I'm going to eat fufu. You guys know fufu? Um, <laughs> when I leave you guys, I'm going to eat my fufu and jama and jama. That is a food that when I eat, I feel good and I can speak to you guys. I'm not going to import anything. I didn't come to America with my head to be brainwashed or to be assimilated. I came for capital <laughs> and I came for knowledge. So I cannot not go and eat my fufu. As I'm talking to you, I, I am getting the smell. And that's why everything <laughs> <on my eyes. laughs> I'm getting the smell, I'm getting it. You need to see me yesterday. We, you know where we were yesterday at the uh, uh, Swahili, the Swahili center. In, you, you guys should come here to Maryland. There's a Swahili center just about uh, 12 minute drive from me. I'll take you guys there. We're all happy that the kind of food that they serve to me. Good meat, good, good meat. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Let Thank me go. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for blessing Thank us today. You so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Ubuntu to well, everyone. This was good. All right. Oh, by the way, um, 